All right, welcome to the almost final lecture in, in 4820 this semester. Probably my final lecture with you this year. Um, we're here, we're wrapping up the segment on, on parsing, on syntactic analysis. I'm sorry I couldn't be here two weeks ago. <coughs> um, I hope the screencast from the preceding year worked okay. Um, even though I had actually moved around a few things in the slides, but um, I'll try to sort of wrap everything up nicely today, um, which is about time because two days from today, and Friday is the deadline for our final um, obligatory assignment, and that's where you actually work with the uh, tree bank parsing, uh, parseval, uh, and generalized chart parsing framework. Then next week, um, Mohav will be putting everything into perspective, uh, reminding you of the many things you've, you've learned this semester, and also use about half the session to work with you through a sample exam. Um, the exam is coming up fast. We have a relatively early exam slot this year, which also means we don't have very much time to register the exam qualifications to the faculty administration, which also means that we have limited flexibility when it comes to accommodating illness-related delays in submitting your final exercise. Um, if you get ill, you get ill, and we'll have to accommodate that. So work with us, tell us, um, but um, we're on a very condensed, rushed schedule here towards the end of the semester. Um, all right. Um, I don't. I think that's the the announcements um, I was expected to make. So today, uh, wrapping up parsing, and then uh, some of you asked, "Will there be a quiz?" Because at about this point in time, we did a quiz in the preceding two years, I think, uh, and and even gave some bonus points. We decided, no, we're not doing a quiz this year. Um, because that also takes a lot of time, um, and we've given you a chance to gain some bonus points by submitting your course midway course evaluation. But I nevertheless have four questions from previous quizzes that um, I think we'll use as, as practical exercises. So I expect that about 30 minutes before the end of today's lecture, um, I'll actually turn off the screencasting and then work with you jointly on those four exercises using the whiteboard and um, these are all immediately related to what we've been doing these past few weeks, generalized chart parsing. And this is maybe the most important insight that, I, that, that, that you've seen in the screencast two weeks ago, but I, it's so important, it's so fundamental, um, so crucial, so central, so life-changing, that I wanted to not miss the opportunity to talk through it one more time with you and give you a chance to ask a question. Because this is where the magic happens. Um, this is how parsing syntactic analysis becomes a problem that we can solve in polynomial time, even though it's a problem of exponential complexity. That's the magic that is happening here. So the key insight is that often for some substring of, say, a larger sentence, there will be multiple ways of arriving at the same constituent category for that substring, where multiple ways means the trees covering that substring differ in their internal structure. And that's what we call local ambiguity. Um, common exam question, define local ambiguity. Um, and um, here I've chosen what I sometimes call the ballistic notation of the space of different analyses. There's also the tabular, tabular or chart notation that's coming up on the next slide. So here each of the entries, each of these arcs, um, um, is an assignment of a constituent category to that substring. And up here I have noted the categories. So 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 9 are NPs, 4, 5, and 8 are PPs, and then the local ambiguity is represented here for the entire substring. I can either combine the NP1 with the PP8, 
or the NP6 with the PP5. And in terms of semantics, meaning making sense of natural language, we've said we're doing grammatical analysis, we're doing syntactic structure to enable interpretation. So what are the two different interpretations? I'm telling you there are two different structural analyses. And what are the, the, the differences in meaning that correspond to them? Yes, so girls with, well, okay, so girls with hats, no, boys with hats from France, yes. Yes. Yes, so it's about the attachment of this prepositional phrase. Either the hats are French and the boys may be Norwegian, they're fashion-oriented Norwegian boys as they go. Um, or um, the boys are Norwegian, no, sorry, the, the, the boys are French, so there, there are some boys with hats, and we don't know whether the hats come from northern Norway or England, or maybe even France, we don't know that. But we know the boys are from France, so the boys are French. So the two different interpretations are French hats or French boys. But the key insight is, either way, this whole thing is going to be a noun phrase. It's going to be a group of boys with hats. And to parse a larger sentence, uh, 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 women with scarves from Norway met boys with hats from France. How many different interpretations do you think that sentence has? I'll repeat it women with scarves from Norway met boys with hats from France. Ah, oh, someone else. You've demonstrated you can navigate this space. So we know that the boys with hats from France have two interpretations. Now I've given you a subject noun phrase to make it a, a full sentence that is women with scarves from Norway. How many interpretations do you expect that will have? Uh, in total four, the, the women, either the scarves are Norwegian or the women are Norwegian, exactly parallel to this one. And then we get two times two, four. So that whole sentence will have four different interpretations. But all of them will be NP, so all of them will have the top level structure S, NP, VP, and the VPs will all have the structure VNP. So the ambiguity about the French hats or the French boys and the Norwegian scarves or Norwegian women, those reside inside the NP. And to decide that the thing as a whole, the sentence, well, the, the, the entire string is a sentence, it's part of the language of the grammar, all I need to know is that women with scarves from Norway can function as an NP, no matter its internal structure, and boys with hats from France can function as an NP, no matter its in internal structure. And so that's why we only put one entry 9 here into this chart, into this encoding of possible assignments of constituent categories to substrings, which means at this point we have some record of the different ways of calling the whole thing, this whole substring, a noun phrase. But we only need to record that fact once. And because we only have one record of calling this substring a noun phrase, we won't have to multiply it out when we put that noun phrase into a larger sentence. So that's the trick that we call packing of local ambiguity. And any questions on that? This is a life-changing realization. This is, so there's abundant ambiguity in natural languages, unlike in formal languages. We don't want ambiguity in a programming language or in a language of logic. In natural language, we actually want ambiguity. It's a feature, it's not a bug of natural language. Um, there's studies that suggest natural languages, human languages use ambiguity 
so that they provide a, a smaller, a more compact encoding of the space of possible utterances, statements I want to make. And because we humans are very good at putting to use knowledge about the world, the situation, the speaker, um, we can deal and resolve, disambiguate that ambiguity very efficiently, typically without noticing. And that means that language, natural language functions as a as a more efficient communication tool and system than it would without ambiguity. But ambiguity is what makes parsing difficult for computers. Because they're not nearly as smart as we are, and probably won't be in <laughs> ever, <laughs> I think, um, in some sense. Um, but let's not take, take on the, 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 the grand, grand AI questions just now. So, um, this is how we contain, we keep local these ambiguities and nevertheless can do all of the computation we need to do to analyze a larger sentence where an ambiguous substring occurs, let's say. Okay, so with that in place, everything else is technical. That's now just taking advantage of this key inside. And the first algorithm that does that is the Cocker-Sami-Younger algorithm. And um, this is the chart or table equivalent of the ballistic diagram I had on the preceding slide. Here for each substring, each cell corresponds to one substring of the input. And I... Uh, brought along this slide, even though it was in last week's set already, because I want to make sure that you understand the indexing, how the cells correspond to um, uh, substrings. So, color coding here, I've highlighted um, 1, 2, 5. We're counting the spaces between the words, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that cell in red corresponds to the substring adored snow in Oslo. And if you recall, we're using the same toy grammar of English here, then that's a VP. It's a verb plus an NP. Um, which cell corresponds to the substring Kim adored snow? In the table. Kim adored snow, that substring. What's the corresponding cell? Zero, two, three. So you say zero, one, two, three. And that would be this cell here. And indeed, there is an S in that cell. And does that make sense? Well, certainly. Kim adored snow. That's a perfectly good sentence of English. It's just not the full string that we're given here. And hence, this is a tree that has the start symbol of the grammar at its root, it just doesn't cover the complete string. Where's the cell that covers the complete string? That's up here. So we could turn this 45 degrees and it would correspond to the ballistic representation. And the CKY algorithm just is a nested, uh, well, three nested loops that <coughs> fill in the cells of this table. Um, in a bottom-up manner, one diagonal at a time. And what, what can we say about the string length corresponding to each cell, or each diagonal even? So as we move upwards in this table, the cells all have the same size, but the corresponding strings get longer and longer. All of the cells in this bottom diagonal correspond to substrings of length one. The cells in this diagonal correspond to substrings of length two. This one goes from zero to two. That's two words. This one goes from one to three. Length three, four, and five. So that's the only cell that covers the entire string. That's another important technique you need to acquire to 
sort of learn to read this representation. It's a very simple, well, it's a very effective at least way of indexing the substrings. And because the CKY algorithm treats each of the cells as a set, this is the union operation, we will never have the same category in a cell more than once. So that's where the packing happens. It's quite possible that there are multiple ways of saying this cell here, for example, I can put VP there. But because the cell is treated as a set, at the end of the day, there will be only one instance of, of VP, even if there were a structural ambiguity. Um, hey, that's another important foundation. Um, and then we observed um, that the CKY algorithm is limited to a subset of context-free grammars that are called Chomsky normal form, and they don't satisfy the general definition of the production rules in a context-free grammar that I gave three weeks ago, where I said the left-hand side is one non-terminal, the right-hand side of each production is a string um, of symbols that are either terminals or non-terminals. That was the general definition of context-free grammar I gave a string of arbitrary length. So-called Chomsky normal form context-free grammars are a subset where the right-hand sides of all of the rules either are exactly two non-terminals or exactly one terminal. And the CKY algorithm depends on that constraint because here when it fills in in the initialization the bottom diagonal it says, I'm looking for rules that have some non-terminal alpha that rewrites to exactly one terminal the ith element of my input string. So here it's looking for lexical rules that have exactly one word on their right-hand side. And then here in the main parsing loop where it works itself upwards in the table, it says, I'm looking for rules um, here in the set of productions that have exactly two non-terminals on their right-hand sides. That have beta 1 and beta 2 as their right-hand side, where beta 1 is in one of the cells that I combine and beta 2 is in the other cell. And when I find such a rule, then I put alpha into the cell that I'm currently computing. Okay, I feel I, you've listened to the screencast multiple times, haven't you? If not, this is actually what we covered two weeks ago. So I can't really <laughs> do it again today. Um, any questions on the CKY algorithm? So it's limited to Chomsky normal form grammars and it has a rigid control structure in the sense that it has to first fill in all possible categories in this bottom diagonal so that it can then be sure to derive all possible categories for the next diagonal. That means it is an exhaustive algorithm um, that when it comes here has considered all possible trees, all possible subtrees, and it is limited to Chomsky normal form context-free grammars. And that is not a desirable linguistic assumption because um, exam question last year, can you think of a linguistic example where the, the, the limitation in Chomsky normal form grammars to at most, no, to exactly two non-terminal symbols in the right-hand side of the production rules is linguistically undesirable? Can anyone think of a, of a a construction, an example in natural language where we might want to write a rule that has more than two non-terminals on the right-hand side? One of you can. Maybe others can too. Yes, you can. You're not clear what I'm asking about. What's your suggestion? A ditransitive verb, very good, that's very uh, linguistically <laughs> precise. So a ditransitive verb is a verb that takes two objects, like give. Give Mary a book. That's a verb that requires two NPs. 
and the sort of most plausible way of writing a grammar of English that would uh, allow the recognition of ditransitive verbs of this class of verbs would be to say, well, I can form a verb phrase by taking a verb and two NPs. And this rule does not satisfy the Chomsky normal form constraint because it has three non-terminals on its, its right-hand side. The CKY algorithm couldn't process it. So that's how we generalized the CKY core ideas to what is called the generalized chart parsing framework. Martin K is generally considered the inventor of this framework. And it, it builds on, on most of the, the, the CKY notion. So the chart is a two-dimensional matrix of edges or chart items, and um, each edge records the instantiation of a production rule for a substring of the input. And the connection to the substrings is made by the start and end string positions corresponding to the row and column index of the cell. So that's straight from CKY. But then we said we'll introduce two types of edges where either I have fully parsed, I have fully instantiated the right-hand side of a rule, and that's what we call a complete item or a passive edge. And this dot here indicates how much of the right-hand side I have actually parsed successfully at that point. So when the dot is at the end of the right-hand side here, that means I have seen both the V and the noun phrase. Um, in contrast, what we don't have in the, and, and, and the passive edges correspond to the constituent categories that I maintain in the CKY table. Um, what I don't have in the CKY algorithm are these incomplete items or active edges where I say, actually, I can record in the chart an edge that corresponds to a partial instantiation of the right-hand side of a rule. So I use the dot here to say, at this point, I am expecting to parse, to find, to derive a verb phrase, and I'm using the rule that says VP goes to VNP, but at this point, all I have seen, all I know is there, all I have confirmed is the verb, and I'm still looking for an NP. So in this respect, this is a, a partial um, chart item, a partial instantiation of the right-hand side of this rule, and it essentially means, um, in a sense, you might say it's a promise. It's a promise saying, if only I can find an NP following the verb, then I will have a VP. But the active edges serve to record in the chart these interim states of computation. So in the CKY algorithm, I take one rule at a time, I look for both of the elements of the right-hand side, if I find them, I add something to the chart. So in each step, the CKY algorithm processes the entire rule. It's looking for all of the elements of the right-hand side. But to be able to do so, it has to restrict the rules to right-hand sides with exactly two non-terminals. We generalize that by saying, I take one of the elements of the right-hand side at a time. So I binarize the instantiation of the right-hand side. And for each such step that I take successfully, I record that success as an active edge in the chart, where the dot here is not at the end of the, the right-hand side. And then, did you listen to last year's screencast? Was I still using the dating metaphor? Probably, because I just can't stay away from it. So then Martin K formulated what he called the fundamental rule of chart parsing, and this is essentially uh, an inference procedure. So this is a, a generalization um, at a fairly high level of abstraction, where he says the entire parsing problem can be formulated as a 
sequence of applications of this fundamental rule. And the fundamental rule says it takes an active edge plus a passive edge, one active edge, one passive edge, um, that are compatible. And to be compatible, they need to be what we call adjacent. So the edge representation here is start index, end index, rule, possibly with the dot somewhere in the middle. And for two edges to be adjacent, it means that the second one starts where the first ends. So that means that the substring i to j concatenated with the substring j to k will correspond to the successful application of this rule. Furthermore, to be compatible, one of them is active and looking as the next thing it is seeking to find, beta i, so some specific non-terminal symbol from the set of categories C. And the passive rule has beta i as its left-hand side symbol. So the passive rule says from j to k, I tell you beta i. This substring is of constituent category beta i. That could be np, let's say. And the active rule says, so far I have successfully parsed i to j. I'm trying to build an alpha, but what I will need next, starting at position j, is a beta i. So the active rule would be, um, oh, we don't have the passive rule here for this one to combine. This, is, this could be the active rule. One, two, three could be the result of the application here. Um, when, the when the fundamental rule succeeds, when I can find a pair of edges that satisfy this condition, then I derive a new edge. I put a new record into my chart. And this now covers the string, the substring from i to k, the concatenation of the two and it advances the dot in the right-hand side of the active rule. And at this point, of course, in this general notation, um, i plus 1 to n can be empty. So at some point, the dot advances to the end of the right-hand side of the rule, and at that point, what I have found is a new passive edge. Right? Um, I have this example of a chart for our running example. Um, this cell here corresponds to the substring 1 to 5, a door snow in Oslo. And here I say that's a near and over complete chart. Um, it's over complete in what is indicated in red here. Um, there are two passive edges here that say 1 to 5, that's a VP. Do you find that surprising? Hopefully not. We know that a door's snow in Oslo has two interpretations. Oslonian snow or Oslonian adoration. So we know that this PP can attach to the NP snow or to the VP a door snow. Parallel to the boys and the hats from France. Um, and in fact here we actually see that to call one to five a verb phrase, I have successfully demonstrated, parsed the combination VP plus PP or V plus NP. And I tend to try and look in the chart for the pieces that we have used to derive these passive edges. Shall we do that? Then I need your help. So, um, we say one to five, um, can be the combination of a VP plus a PP. Where are those two nodes? Where's the VP and where's the PP that we have combined? So again, we're exercising how to read this table. Any suggestions? I mean, there are many tables, so for, for this part of the question, we can um, um, limit ourselves, restrict ourselves to the passive edges. 
Which are the passive patches? That's what they call a softball. You can answer that question. How do we recognize the passive edges? Scroll, just go down. And you find passive edges at the bottom. I'm not fully convinced of that answer. <laughs> um, so here we said active versus passive edges. And there's a, a visual property that we can observe. The passive edges are the ones where <laughs> where the dot is at the end. And we find those all over the chart. So to actually demonstrate that this whole string is a sentence, we would have to find a passive edge up here in the, in the top right cell. Because the passive edges are the complete instantiation of rules. The active edges are just intermediate steps that I record in the chart for convenience. So we're looking for two passive edges, one of category VP, one of category PP. And together, they account for a doors snow in Oslo, that substring. So where are they? Where are the passive edges? Maybe this is an error actually in my chart. It's possible. But let's see. Uh, this one maybe? No, it's active. It has the dot in the middle. We're only looking for passive edges. This one maybe. So this one says from one to three, there is a VP. One, two, three, that's a door snow. A door snow is a verb phrase, fine, so plausible. Let's say this one. And now we need to find a PP that we can combine with it. Maybe this one? Do me the favor and scream, no, this is an active edge. Um, this one maybe, this is passive. And this one goes from three to five. So. This edge and this edge, but they're not adjacent. They're not next to each other. How can we combine them? This edge here and this edge here. They are, well, the, <laughs> the strings, the corresponding strings are adjacent because this one covers one, two, three. And so all of the adjacent edges, the edges that will start where this one ends, will be in row three, and this one is. And hence, their strings are adjacent. They satisfy the formal rule, the, the fundamental rule. Um, and this VP combined with this PP gives us this analysis here. And we should even be able to trace it because we know that to have a passive edge here, there must be a partial instantiation of this same rule where the dot is between the two right-hand side symbols, where we have found the VP but not the PP yet. And that is this one here. So one, two, three is a verb phrase where if only we could find a PP, we could build another verb phrase, a larger verb phrase. So that's the active edge from which this passive edge was derived. This active edge plus this passive edge are the two players in the fundamental rule. Very important that you stitch that together yourselves at home. Um, now we have another entry here of same category. Where are those two edges? One, two, V, adores, passive, and So now one, two, that means we need to search in row two. We need to look at the edges that start at string position two. And we're looking for an NP. It could be this NP. So V plus NP, these two combined. Can they give us this? No, because this NP ends at three. 
So this V and this NP actually do combine, but then that goes from one, two, three. That's this edge here. This edge here, V followed by NP, is this V plus this NP. Snow in Oslo. So these are the two readings. This is how that verb phrase is ambiguous. Um, but we want to continue to pack local ambiguity, so we actually don't want two entries here. And so we want to actually collapse these into one. That's what we'll be doing next. Um, then we talked about how to actually orchestrate the process, how to keep track of um, which combinations of edges still need to be computed. And I don't want to go through this again. It's kind of peripheral, but the chart parsing algorithm generalizes CKY in two senses. One is that it's applicable to arbitrary context-free grammars, not just Chomsky normal form grammars. Two, it allows one to fill in the chart in arbitrary order, and it's still going to be correct and complete. So I can fill in the chart bottom up as CKY does, or top down, or best first. Um, it's, it gives me complete flexibility in the order of computation, and that's a big advantage. So it's a generalization in two, um, two properties, two, two of the restrictions that are built into the CKY algorithm that we observed. But now, um, let's go back to packing local ambiguity, um, because that's the we're, we're now approaching the new topic of today's lecture, <laughs> um, 35 minutes into the lecture. Um, the sort of last technicality that we introduced two weeks ago already is that we actually want to keep track of the complete trees, not just the category symbols. And so for the right-hand side of the edges in the chart, what we record in the edge data structure is not the category that we have found, but an identifier of the edge which is of that category. That's a, a, a small technicality. So in this representation, this is a shorter string now, um, because I couldn't fit the full sentence onto the slide, Kimador's snow. Um, for each of the, let's say, passive edges, we can just look up. So the, the thing we did at great pain a few minutes ago, is a lot easier now. Um, we can ask edge 15 is the combination of edges 11 and 13. So all we need to do is find 11, that's the verb adores, and 13, that's the NP snow. So here, how the pieces have fit together is now made explicit. That's what I call back pointers. And that means I can look at any edge, for example the one up here in the top, and say, okay, you tell me this is a sentence, but what's the tree? And then I can say, well, okay, uh, find edges 8 and 15. Those are going to be the daughters of the S. And so 8 is going to be an NP, and 15 is going to be a VP. And so that, again, corresponds to more tree, because this has instantiated a production rule of the grammar, so find me 11 and 13, and 11 is a verb, and 13 is an NP. So I can just take that edge and read off the corresponding tree. That's what the back pointers give me. I can say this as an NP, that was number 8. Uh, it's going to be difficult to read using the pen that I'm using here. So this is number 8, and then the VP is number 15, and this VP in turn is comprised of an NP and, no, a verb and 
and MP. So the back point is, don't change anything contentfully. They just make it a lot easier to find the daughter edges. And that means each of the edges actually represents a tree. You with me? Maybe. <laughs> Hopefully, yes. Um, so that was another technicality. And now let's talk about, um, in this revised universe, how do we actually obtain this notion of ambiguity packing, of implementing that key insight where we started today. And the general idea, the plan is to have exactly one edge um, for each category assignment, for each constituent category alpha that I can assign to substring i to j. So just as we had in the beginning, only one such entry for a given substring and a given constituent category alpha. That's the invariant that we want to maintain. And we'll call this edge the representative. It will represent all possible ways of deriving that category for that substring. It will represent the local ambiguity. Uh, so it may represent more than one tree. And when it does, when there actually when there is local ambiguity, when there are structurally different analyses that lead to alpha from i to j, then this edge will have more than one daughter sequence. It will have more than one sequence of back pointers. And we implement that in the, this is essentially commentary on the code. This part of the algorithm um, is what we gave to you didn't ask you to implement this part yourself. Um, this gives us a notion of equivalence classes for these three properties. So whenever two edges have the same i and j, cover the same string, and they have the same left-hand side non-terminal category alpha, they will be grouped into an equivalence class. And to maintain this invariant, every time we have computed a new edge, we have successfully applied the fundamental rule. Um, then, before we add that edge to the chart, or to the agenda if it were, we first ask the chart, maybe there is an edge already that is equivalent. And the chart gives us trivial indexing by substrings, so we just find the cell that corresponds to i to j, that's an array lookup, and then we say, okay, my new edge has some category alpha prime. Is there an edge in this cell from i to j that also has, that already has category alpha prime? And if so, then we will call the existing edge the host edge. It's in the chart already. And we will use it to record the new structural analysis for that substring that arrives at the same constituent category. So we pack the new edge E um, into H, which means we technically record that equivalence. The new edge E does not go into the chart. There is a representative already, H. So we already know that I to J can be parsed as category alpha. And that means there won't be any computation on E. E won't cause us any trouble, won't cost us anything. And this is the what is called the, the forest construction. So this packed representation of multiple trees is often called a parse forest, um, where an edge in the chart actually can represent multiple trees, multiple subtrees. And at the end of the day, I'm of course often interested in, I'm, I'm most typically interested in one tree. Very soon it will be the most probable tree. Most users don't want to know how many distinct interpretations are there of the string you've given me, but they want to know well, what does it mean? What's your best guess at what it means? And to answer that question, we need to actually unpack. We need to extract from this forest the one tree that we believe is the correct 
the intended analysis. And um, I think at that, I'll take a break here. Uh, you guys got some coffee. And then, I'm not saying you need it, <laughs> but I've had that impression. Um, and um, then we come back to sort of the culmination point of this um, intriguing universe where we look at this forest and look at how we unpack, how we extract the complete trees, and then we will put probabilities on top of that. So that, what that, that is what remains to be done for us today. Okay, let's take a break. Okay, so this was the, the mechanics, you might say, of make, making sure that we still have only one entry in the chart for um, cases of, of, of local ambiguity, and yet can maintain these expressive or rich edges where each edge has a set of back pointers to the constituent pieces um, that are its daughters such that each edge represents one or more trees. So now let's look at this process of unpacking. We have a packed forest, but Christmas is coming up, we need trees. Um, and this is a very sort of hypothetical example. Don't try to put Snow or Oslo or Kim or French boys or anything here. Um, so this is a, a, an abstract example showing a hypothetical parse forest. This might be the structure that we, um, that we derive <coughs> from the generalized chart parsing algorithm. So what this means is we have an edge here that has back pointers to two daughters. And one of them here um, actually represents local ambiguity, so the ovals represent um, equivalence classes. So edges 4 and 2 will correspond to the same substring and um, they have the same left-hand side category alpha. They're both NPs or VPs or whatever. So that's how we read this interpretation. So this when, when an oval is formed here then um, we have packed an edge E into an edge, a host edge H, and H will be the representative. From what I've told you, can you reason, <coughs> find out which of the edges in this forest are in the chart proper and which are packed away into host edges? Can we tell that difference? So I said when we pack a new edge E into an existing edge H, then E is not inserted into the chart, into the agenda. It's not processed further. So which are the edges that are have undergone full processing in the chart, the representatives? How can we tell that, <coughs> that difference? You have a suggestion. Very good. So the edges in the chart are those that occur as daughters, that is, that are being pointed to by other edges. And <coughs> these are the ones in bold here. So now I have um, moved this link here to the entire equivalence class because edge number two is the representative for this equivalence class and I have highlighted those that are the representatives. So this is in a sense closer to what we actually compute because the back pointer from one goes to one specific edge to two. But 2 represents a larger equivalence class. 2 has edge number 4 packed in it, and that means edge number 4 and its daughter sequence um, represents another structural way of arriving at the same category for that substring. 
So this is the sort of conceptual representation of the, the parse forest. Now what does it mean to extract trees? Um, <coughs> can you make a guess about how many trees are in this forest? So if I now say, um, good, you tell me women with scarves from Norway met boys with hats from France is a sentence. Very well. But what does it actually mean? Give me the full tree. I want to know more than it's a sentence. I want to know how many different interpretations does it actually have. Give me the complete parse trees. That's unpacking. So we have a forest and now we want to enumerate all of the complete trees. We want to make those ambiguities, the local ambiguities that we have packed. Now we want to explode them. We want to multiply them out. So any, any ideas? How would we go about that? We might maybe start down here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so edge number six, do you think it corresponds to how many trees does it represent? One of you thinks the answer is clear. Other suggestions? Or edge number six. I tell you it represents at least one tree, maybe more. What are those trees? Didn't hear the first part. I so it's six with either 10 or 11 as its only daughter. So the trees are either this configuration or this configuration. Six with one daughter, which is 10, or six with one daughter, which is 11. So that means six corresponds to two distinct trees. And then equivalent to six, there is another edge, seven, has no daughters, but that's a tree again. So this equivalence class here corresponds to a total of different of, of three different subtrees. And now if we were to ask, okay, edge number two, well, let's go to this representation. So just two, ignoring four for now, ignoring the equivalence class at this level. How many different trees are there with two at their top? <coughs> three, and they are? You say three. So they are two with five as its first daughter and six as its second daughter where we now have two ways of unpacking six. <coughs> so either the six that dominates 10 or the six that dominates um, 11. And in addition to that, seven as its second daughter. because 6 and 7 are in an equivalence class. So this equivalence class here represents three trees, and that's the only local ambiguity um, within the tree represented by edge number 2. Hence, 2 also represents three distinct trees. They are on the board. You have a question? No. Okay, um, and now four represents three subtrees for its second daughter and two sub I heard six somewhere back there, very good. So four represents six different trees. It's either be going to be four with nine and six, which can be six dominates 10 or six dominates 11, 
or it's going to be 4 with 9 and 7, or it's going to be 4 with 8 and 6, where 6 can be 6 dominated in 10 or dominated in 11. So that's where the cross multiplication happens. Do you see that? 2 here times 3 here. <coughs> and this process we will formalize. Um, this is essentially writing down the local combinatorics. And so for each of these edges, I have written down, um, for each of the interesting edges, you might say, 5 and 3, no ambiguity there. Um, I have written down to what they unfold locally, what combinatorics they give rise to, and then where they include another edge that is itself a representative of more than one tree, like 6, we need to multiply here. So we have 2, 3, 5, 6 different trees here. And um, 2, 3, 3 different trees here. So 4 actually stands in for 6 different trees. And 2 stands in for 3 different trees, and that means 2 has a sort of tree count of 3, 4 has a tree count of 6, so in total the this forest encodes 9 trees. And we have started writing them out, but you might actually as an exercise spell all of them out. So this is a very compact representation of a potentially very large number of trees because there's cross multiplication, the cross product essentially, of the local ambiguities at each level. So we can easily, I hope, imagine that this forest can represent a large number of trees. In fact, we know that the number of trees in the worst case grows exponentially in the length of the input. We observed that three weeks ago. Um, and yet, this forest we can compute, or we can construct it in polynomial time. The same construction to observe its complexity that we did for the CKY algorithm two weeks ago applies to the generalized chart parsing algorithm. We haven't changed the complexity. It's a cubic time algorithm. That's nice. Kind of magic, but now we're seeing through the layers of magic. So I was saying the problem is exponential complexity because there are exponentially many different, there can be exponentially many different complete trees. But I have now split the problem into two, two sub-problems, the forest construction and the unpacking. And the forest construction is the sub-problem that I can actually solve in polynomial time. What's the complexity of the unpacking, the worst case complexity of the unpacking? Okay, let's do a, a very basic reasoning over complexity. What's going to be the complexity of an algorithm that enumerates, that computes an exponential number of results? That's going to be exponential. If you're going to return a number that grows, uh, a number of distinct structures that grows exponentially, there's no way of doing that in fewer steps than exponentially many. So unpacking, if we say, give me all of the trees from this forest, that's still going to be exponential. It's only the forest construction that happens in polynomial time. So what have I gained, you might ask? What I have gained is that I typically don't need to unpack exhaustively. I'm typically not interested in all of the trees. I'm typically interested in one of them, the best one. And so, <coughs> oh, let's first observe what happened this far in generalized chart parsing. Um, this summarizes up to this point the three lectures. So we're using grammars. Uh, which encode the structure, the grammatical, the syntactic structure of the language, and essentially each rule tells us something about dominance and the linear order of, of daughters. And 
Um, we have looked at context-free grammars as one specific um, instance of formal grammars as a generative framework. We can say that <coughs> a context-free grammar defines a language by um, generating a set of trees and then the string that corresponds to the leaves of all of these trees, that's the language of the grammar. Um, natural language makes use of ambiguity um, and um, in the worst case um, there can be exponentially many different syntactic and correspondingly semantic analysis for a string and that means parsing is a search problem at its core. Um, introducing this notion of packing or bounding of local ambiguity, taking advantage of that key inside, gives us a tractable cubic time algorithm to construct the forest, the packed representation. And chart parsing, as we've introduced it here, is another instance of dynamic programming. I will never... So, once I put something into the chart, category assignment, an edge for that substring, i to j, um, I will never recompute that. I'll reuse that. And generalized chart parsing allows me to do that in any order. Um, <coughs> so now I have this forest, but what is missing is um, um, extracting, according to the probabilities that we added to CFGs, the um, most likely, the most plausible interpretation. And no, you haven't seen these quotes before. That um, just briefly relates to a, a debate of the past. It almost feels at this point. So Noam Chomsky, for example, uh, an important linguist in the theoretical linguist, um, might still today say um, the notion probability of a sentence is entirely useless under any <laughs> known interpretation of this term. Um, <coughs> that's a theoretical linguist's assessment. The notion probability of a sentence is what a language model computes and that is incredibly useful in sort of practical everyday applications in predictive input in uh, machine translation and so in, in, in terms of the um, in terms of the, the, the practical applications um, this Laplacian position um, is, is, is really where we are today. Uh, machine learning, sort of modern artificial intelligence is, is machine learning. It's, it's extracting generalizations over observable data using statistical regularities. Um, and um, Chomsky is here taking a, a, a theoretical um, position where he says, I think, uh, essentially he might say to what we're about to do, but um, the way humans resolve that ambiguity about um, the French hats and the Norwegian women, um, um, we can't explain that in terms of probability. We need to explain that in, term of the, in terms of the cognitive processes, in terms of the reasoning, in terms of the knowledge that the humans apply about the world, but most of that is inaccessible to modern, our current computational systems. And so hence we approximate that cognitive process using statistical techniques and that approximation is really very successful practically. So it works really quite well even though it's linguistically and theoretically not the ultimate, it's not an explanation of the actual cognitive process. You have a, qu a remark in the back Maybe. So you're asking the philosophical question, isn't this actually, so this statistical modeling that we apply, couldn't that be viewed as a, well you said approximation, but I think you actually have a, hold a stronger position. Isn't, isn't that actually a model of the learning that humans maybe undergo? Um, and um, um, in, in this, so you're saying when we're confronted with an ambiguity, we're equally confused as a machine. 
and we, we, we need to make assumptions or we need to reason over the state of the world or yeah. Uh, do we know anything about these boys and, and have we heard about French hats before? That kind of, of, of reasoning. Um, <coughs> but um, I don't want to get carried away all too far here. Um, um, in what is called psycholinguistics or sort of the, the cognitive science approach to parsing, to natural language parsing, there is, for example, a lot of evidence that humans in their parsing incrementally um, linguistic signals that they hear or read uh, typically don't even consider any ambiguity. They operate inter deterministically. So there's very little confusion. Every now and again they actually are led astray. So-called garden path sentences. The horse raced past the barn, fell. We have a hard time parsing that. The horse raced past the barn, fell. So there's a horse that races past that building, the barn, and then it falls down. If I put in a, a, a relative pronoun, the, the horse that raced past the barn, fell, it's very clear what the structure is. But if I say the horse raced past the barn, then you want to interpret that as a regular sentence, not as a relative clause, and you're surprised when I give you another verb where that horse is actually falling. So that's a... Uh, I've gone astray already. Um, so the, that, that's the kind of phenomena um, that um, cognitive scientists, psycholinguists study. And our probabilistic models are unable to give an explanation of these phenomena. So they are, personally I believe that, and, and, and most psycholinguists nowadays would agree that there are regularities related to frequency in human sentence processing. But their complexity is not adequately represented or captured by the models that we put to use for practical purposes, like an n-gram language model or a probabilistic context-free grammar. So there's still a, a sort of mismatch here. <coughs> but it's not so much about, it can't be statistical, the, the, there's nothing statistical to it, that used to be Chomsky's position. Um, but um, it's certainly more complex than the modeling that we apply. So this is a, an engineering approximation still, what we're going to do, but a successful one. And we're engineers. So, um, right, one of the pioneers of, of that movement, Fred Jelinek, <laughs> Uh, so y you can probably see between the lines there was a war of cultures here <laughs> for uh, several decades, but I consider that resolved now. So this is historic background. Um, we don't hesitate to put statistical modeling to use. It is what has made language technologies practically useful. So nothing, nothing wrong about it. So how do you, how do we do that? Um, we have a parse forest. We have probabilities on the rules, um, and um, essentially, I'm, I'm giving away the general idea. We want to extract the most probable tree and we want to adapt something that we know well, the Viterbi algorithm over lattices, over the sequence labeling lattices that a hidden Markov model generates. And this is just the Viterbi algorithm for HMMs. Um, where the, the trellis, um, the Viterbi matrix, for a state S at time point I is computed by finding the best possible path into that cell of the trellis. That is going back one time point and so one column back and then going through all of the rows, all of the preceding states, uh, well, all of the possible states at that preceding time point, and um, taking their Viterbi probability, that is the path up to that preceding time point, times the transition probability from K to S, times the emission probability of current observation OI given state S. So that's something we know. And 
we want to adapt that to the parse forest, and it's a, an almost trivial adaptation. Um, we take advantage of the structure of the parse forest to essentially guide that, um, that computation. There's no two-dimensional table here. The, what corresponds to the trellis essentially are the edges in the forest. So those tell us the range of possible combinations that we need to consider. The HMM trellis, actually we consider all possible combinations. It's a fully dense connected graph. So from each cell, each state in the preceding time point, we consider all paths to all states, all cells in the next time point. It's a, a matrix that is fully connected. And um, that's the difference. The forest already gives us a subspace, essentially, of combinations that we need to consider, because it's only those that the grammar licensed, it's only those ways of putting together trees that the grammar allows that we need to consider for the most probable tree. And so we will attach Viterbi probabilities to our edges. This process will be guided by the dominance relations and the equivalence classes in the forest. And we will say <coughs> the Viterbi probability of edge E will be um, the probability of the rule that gave us E. So each edge is an instantiation of a production rule. That means, means E encodes some rule alpha goes to beta 1 dot 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 beta n. That is the rule that we used when we put E into the chart. Only doing this over passive, passive edges here. When we're done constructing the forest, the active edges are irrelevant. They record intermediate steps of computation, but it's only passive edges that record complete parses. So we're only doing this to passive edges, hence no dots here. And then, essentially, the instantiation of this rule for each beta 1 to beta n, I will have effectively back pointers, or in practice I will have back pointers. I have not recorded these categories, but the links, the pointers to the actual daughters. And so for each of them, um, this definition, this recursive definition tells us, okay, the daughter edges, they have a Viterbi probability. And um, <coughs> the product of the tree as a whole, that's an application of the chain rule, the, the chain rule, yeah, um, um, will correspond to the product of the Viterbi probabilities of all of the daughters times the probability of the rule itself. <coughs> um, so this is, in a sense, just rewriting um, the same basic idea and the same equation, the same maximization, but now over this constrained space of possible structures that the forest describes. And um, this Viterbi probability for each edge tells me um, the maximum probability of assigning category alpha to substring i to j corresponding to that edge. And that maximum probability, again, will be computed from one specific, or it will correspond to one specific subtree among the subtrees that that edge represents. And so to ultimately extract the tree that corresponds to the Viterbi probability for each edge at the top and recursively all of the subtrees, I also need uh, this set of, I need to keep track of the, this set of daughters that led to the maximum probability. Each edge represents multiple sets of daughters. That's how an edge represents multiple trees. But one of them will correspond to the maximum probability, the Viterbi probability of that edge. So at this point, I was planning to 
actually look at the implementation of the V2B algorithm. That's my next slide. And play with it, but I think I'll skip that and ask you to either do that yourselves. Um, in fact, the exercise asks you to do that and comment on what you see. So um, if you sort of take this adaptation and now look at what the code actually does and look at where it calls itself recursively and how it records the one set of daughters that corresponds to the maximum probability, then I think you should be able to answer that question. And, and that is really the question that puts it all together. So we've given you the code for the Viterbi one best forest decoding, the adaptation of the Viterbi algorithm that extracts the tree with the Viterbi probability given a forest. And that is the tree that is guaranteed to have the highest the maximum probability among the trees in that forest. So I think I'll not bring up the code now because then we would use our remaining time. Um, I'll very quickly just tick these off. We're done with this segment at this point. So we have taken this leap here from point-wise classification, sequential classification to structured prediction is the general machine learning term where for an observation, a string, we can now predict the most likely syntactic structure for that string. And that means we can enable analysis. And Google, for example, when was it? 2011, I think, um, turned on syntactic parsing, uh, initially only for English, for everything that they crawl off the web. Um, they are not deriving PTB style uh, parse trees. They are deriving something um, simpler than that. But the parse trees that they compute are actually um, um, informed, um, even their parsers trained for English, uh, used to be at least, I'm not sure that's still true because they're newer tree banks, on um, the pen tree bank data, the data that you're using. And um, they found that, that parsing everything they crawl off the web gives them um, advantages in answering queries, in uh, populating what they call the knowledge graph, in machine translation. Um, it's expensive, so cubic time algorithm. Um, well in fact, their parser is approximative, so it has better complexity, but still, um, um, a search engine, as it crawls the web, is very reluctant to invoke expensive computation of what it receives. But um, Google found when they took that step that it really paid off in several of their products. Um, they're probably applying syntactic parsing in Gmail. So it's really gotten to a point where syntactic analysis um, is now what we sometimes call commodity technology. Sort of many applications that process, that do something more or less meaningful or more or less intelligent in relation to human, to natural language, um, benefit from trying to work out the grammatical structure. One example I'd like to give is uh, when was that? Six or so years ago, Cisco acquired Tanberg. So Tanberg, Norwegian uh, uh, IT uh, hardware company, had specialized in uh, video conferencing products. And I think still today, Cisco's line of video conferencing products sort of comes from that tradition. And <coughs> if you um, use what is often called a bag of words approach, as we did in the vector space models, to, um, to natural language processing, then the two sentences, Cisco acquired Tanberg and Tanberg acquired Cisco, are identical. They contain the same words. Um, they're not identical in their syntactic structure. In one, Cisco is the subject, and the subject is the agent of the acquisition, and Tanberg is the object, and in the other one, it's, it's vice versa. So if you are interested in the relations between entities, um, 
then syntactic analysis is the path to making that explicit. Okay, so that was my <coughs> conclusion in the three lecture segment on grammatical analysis that completes the, the content part um, for this semester. Um, I brought along these four exercises from a past quiz. Um, I was expecting to work through them with you in detail. I think we will at most be able to do one or two, so I'll give you the four. So um, this is exercising our knowledge of context-free grammars and trying to form intuitions about, the, about how ambiguity originates. Um, so the question is, given this grammar that essentially says a noun can be formed from two nouns, a process called compounding. In Norwegian, German, you do that in the word formation. There are no spaces. English does it in the syntax. Um, so, uh, kitchen towel or a towel rack, these are constituents. They are groups that act as, as, as a whole. I'll skip through the four exercises first. Um, then we have our familiar grammar and our familiar CKY parse table. And we're asking essentially, similar to what we did today, which pairs of input cells and which productions from the production or productions from the grammar give rise to the derivation of the category S here in cell 05. So how did I get there essentially? Should be able to answer that at this point. Um, a packed parse forest looks familiar, or oh, it's a different forest. Um, how many complete trees are represented in this forest? That's what we did earlier. Just asking for the number here, but it may be beneficial to actually write them down. And finally, parser evaluation. We didn't talk about that today, but three weeks ago. It's related to what we're currently asking you to implement. Um, <coughs> so we say that this is the correct tree on the left, the gold standard tree. The output of the system is the one on the right. It's in this space of kitchens and uh, towel racks. And um, we're asking you to, to compute the Parseval score for this one. I think we can do in the remaining six minutes one of these exercises probably, jointly. Because I don't want to throw out the answers at you. I want to work with you and work out the answers. Uh, is there a clear preference? Parseval, parse forest, CKY, or context-free grammar ambiguity? Which, who, who would like to do, well, I have a suspicion. Who would like to do this one? It's about half. Who would like to do this one? It's fewer. I've had enough of those parse forests. Um, CKY? Compounds? This one's fun, actually. But my suspicion was you would like to do this one because you're working on that uh, exercise. <laughs> Not calling you predictable. Um, <coughs> I failed to turn off the recording. I think I'll do that at this point because now we'll be writing on the board. So, bye everyone at home. Wish you could be here.